Welcome to the AV1611 Hour. My name is Nelson Turner. This broadcast is dedicated to the King James Bible, the Word of God, and the English language for you English speakers all over the world. Today I want to deal again with the Inquisition. This will be part three of a multiple series, multiple section series on the Inquisition and on responses to the Inquisition. The Inquisition is with us right now in this country, and it's with us right now in the world. If you want to look for the most faithful representation of the Inquisition, you'd only have to look to Red China. It was back in the early 70s, actually late 60s and early 70s, that Richard Milhouse Nixon and his Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, set up this detente, so to speak, with the uh, Chinese, the communist Chinese. He met them on their own terms and established normal relations with people, with a government that is hell-bent on destroying their own population and killing their own population and has been doing it ever since the Red Chinese took over in China. Uh, for a mere thought, for a mere word, for one email, for one disobedience, people are killed, they're racked, they're tortured, or they're just shot summarily on the spot in China. And if you're an enemy of the Chinese, you may be taken and put into a ward where you're waiting, and then you'll be taken into a surgical room where they'll remove your organs one after another. As you die from the surgery, they'll just leave you to bleed out and die after the surgery's over because you do not agree with them about spiritual or secular matters. There is no room in communist China for dissent. And that's the very same premise on which the Catholic, the Papal Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition was founded. That there is no room for dissent. That there is no room for disagreement. If you disagree with the papal authorities, if you disagree with the papist over any matter of religion or even secular matters, or you say something amiss concerning them and their doings, for instance, if you call Rome the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, if you call her the whore of Babylon, if you say that the priests are idolaters, you're automatically subject to being punished with death by the Inquisition. Now, granted, at this point in time in the United States, they do not have the opportunity to put you to death. But at such time as they do have the opportunity, they will do it. They've done it before and they will do it again. And communist China right now is an Inquisition because Roman Catholicism at its basis is atheistic. And communism at its base is atheistic. They don't believe in an afterlife. They don't believe that there are going to be recompenses made once men leave their bodies. They don't believe that men have immortal souls. And very, very few, the bishops and the cardinals and the popes, believe any of those things either. Religion is a mockery. And it's really, the papacy is nothing but a political structure and apparatus set up to oppress men. And it's of the devil. They are all of their father, the devil, and the lust of their father they will do. And he was a murderer from the beginning. But I want to read some sections from Motley's history of the rise of the Dutch Republic concerning the Inquisition. I think Americans and people in the world, Christians in the world, need to remember what happened to your brothers and sisters in time past just for having a Bible study in their own home, just for doing what we're doing right here. Well, what happened to people just for reading the Bible, loving the Bible, and refusing to attend Mass? What happened to men that grabbed the wafer, the host, from the priest and threw it on the ground and broke it in pieces in a public venue in the church? What happened to these people? I'm going to read you some of these accounts first to set this up for part three of the Inquisition. Then we're going to talk about iconoclast. Do you know what an iconoclast is? It's one that destroys icons. It's a term that was invented by the Catholics for Protestants who destroyed the Catholic relics, the Catholic altars, the Catholic statues. Those that went in and wrecked all of those things and tore them down and looked upon them as mere images and mere idols and an offense to Almighty God, which they are. They went in and destroyed these things. They were called iconoclasts. And by so doing, they were immediately subject to punishment by death. In fact, I'm going to read a section from this book. At some point, I believe it was 1566, the whole of the population of the Netherlands, upwards of 3 million men, women, and children, were declared en masse to be heretics and to all be worthy of the death sentence. And it was urged forward that that should be carried out, that the whole population 
of the nations which are now called Holland and Belgium would be exterminated for their heresies. Well, that's no different. That's the papal objective anywhere in the world is to destroy all opposition. And that's the same objective of the Chinese red communist, to destroy all opposition. And these communists have infiltrated our political structures. They've infiltrated our domestic structures. They've infiltrated various different facets of our society and culture. And they've convinced people through, uh, I'm looking for the right word, basically through a, a social networking warfare to convince people of communist principles, communist ideals, and socialistic principles, and to think that those things are worth fighting for and killing others for. That's what's going on in America. These people that are protesting in the streets, they are communists, they are Marxists, they are socialists, and they will kill you, and they will destroy you, because they are really just part of the Inquisition that's been spread abroad by the Chinese government. The Chinese government, in its final goal, and its final purpose worldwide, is to destroy all opposition against itself. Again, it's a mirror image of the papacy and the papacy's inquisition. Now I'm going to read from John Luther Motley's um, books. It's called The Rise of the Dutch Republic. It's a big set. I'm going to just read a couple places. And... Uh, yeah, here, I'll read first what I just referred to. This is from his history, which is a profound history, very solid writing, very interesting writing, lively writing, which is a good thing for historians to be lively writers, not dry, dull writers. But he's speaking here of the monarch, Philip II, and what his purpose and his uh, goal was, and how the Roman tyrant, the Pope, wished that his enemies' heads were all upon a single neck, that he might strike them off at a blow. The Inquisition assisted Philip, that is the emperor, to place the heads of all his Netherlands subjects upon a single neck for the same fell purpose. Upon the 16th of February, 1568, sorry I was wrong by two years, a sentence of the Holy Office condemned all the inhabitants of the Netherlands to death as heretics. From this universal doom, only a few persons, especially named, were accepted. A proclamation of the king, dated 10 days later, confirmed this decree of the Inquisition and ordered it to be carried into instant execution without regard to age, sex, or condition. This is probably the most concise death warrant that was ever framed or issued. Three millions of people, men, women, and children, were sentenced to the scaffold in three lines, and it was well known that these were not harmless thunders, like some bulls of the Vatican, but serious and practical measures which it was intended should be enforced, the horror which they produce may be easily imagined. The Hollanders, the Netherlanders, they understood and knew that this wasn't just a joke, that every effort would be made to carry these things out. And really, the papacy claims to have never changed. They always claim to be the church that always been the same and will always be the same. Now, we know that's not true. They've changed in doctrines numerous times. They've added one thing after another, one fabrication, one lie, um, one image idolatry after another. And they wound up with declaring the infallibility of the Pope in 1867 or thereabouts. And uh, that was, of course, when the Pope was a prisoner in his own palace. But they declared him to be infallible in matters of faith, practice, and doctrine, which he certainly is not. He's the vilest heretic that has ever lived. The Pope is that man of sin, that son of perdition. And too few Protestant preachers are Protestants. They don't proclaim these words. In fact, they teach things pursuant to the Council of Trent and that line up directly with papal doctrine. Now, the iconoclast, I just read you this example of what was put forward as a law and was then sought to be fulfilled in its entirety by the Inquisition, by not just the Spaniards, but by the papal inquisitors that were sent to the Netherlands. But the Dutch people, they were courageous and they had a reaction. Their reaction was to arm themselves to the teeth and to go out and have revival meetings, as it were, in the fields and meadows all across the country. They had been doing it 
ever since the Spanish bondage had occurred, but it broke out on large to where there were 10, 12, 16, 20, or even 30,000 people gathered for field preachings. And the field preachings were so organized that when the men came out to the preachings, they pushed the woman, women forward to the front near the pu pulpit, and the men surrounded the outlying areas, all armed with their pistols, with their swords, their poignards, with clubs and cudgels ready to do battle if anybody would assault them. Whole cities would be emptied out for these street preachings. There was a great move of God. Not only the common people, but the nobility had received the doctrines of the Reformation, and they were all becoming Calvinist or Lutherans in their faith and beliefs. They were born again, washed in the blood, and born of the Spirit of God, became new creatures in Christ Jesus, and they came out armed to the teeth, ready to do battle, just to be able to hear the gospel and the sayings of the meek Lord Jesus Christ. And they were willing to suffer even on the death that they might serve God and worship him in spirit and truth. Now the Roman Inquisition, the Catholic Inquisition, was a terrible thing. It was a bloody thing. It was an awful thing. And I want to read this first, one more section from this book, to put it up front so you understand what comes thereafter. Um, the ultimate result of the Inquisition was a loathing and a despising of all things Catholic to the point where common, lowly, um, virtually illiterate commoners who were saved and born again gathered together in great bands and invaded the churches in Antwerp and all the outlying areas, indeed in all the cities in Holland and the Netherlands, and went in and broke down and destroyed all the images, all the idols, all the things that had to do with Catholic worship. They went in and tore those churches apart. They broke down, which, and this was basically ensuring themselves of a death sentence by Philip II of Spain. Because they were forbidden to even have a Bible in their own homes. They were forbidden to sing psalms and have any kind of worship outside of the Roman Catholic Church. But they, in their boldness, and they, in their zeal to Christ, went out into the open fields. They couldn't meet inside the camp, so they went outside the camp, which is the picture that we have in the scripture and all through history. Organized religion becomes corrupt, it becomes unclean, it becomes filthy in the sight of God. It becomes a worship of mammon instead of a worship of God. It becomes a worship of the belly by idolaters. And then, those that worship God in spirit and truth separate themselves, come out from among them, and touch not the unclean thing that God might receive them unto himself. This is what we do here this day in our worship. There is a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. There's a time to break things down and destroy things. There's a time to build things up. There's certainly always a time to break down and destroy idolatry, and idols, and then to build up the true worship of Jesus Christ. There's a time to cast away stones. There's a time to break down the heathen altars, to smash and destroy their implements of worship, to take their dagons and throw them down upon the doorstep of his tabernacle and cut his hands and feet off of him. Men of God in the Old Testament physically destroyed the idols of the heathen. They destroyed the altars of Baal, they destroyed the, all the accoutrements, as it were, those things pertaining to the worship of idols and devils. The first move of God in restoration of his true worship for his own called people was to order his people and set his people in order to go out and destroy the idols of the heathen, to break down the images of false worship and to lay them low and burn them, and to break apart their altars, to break apart their tabernacles, to break apart their churches. Every real move of God in the Old Testament was accompanied by a move of God in his people to destroy all the things having to do with idolatry, to break down the tabernacles and the houses of the Sodomites, as it says in a place, to break down all the places of heathen worship, to get them out of the land so that God could bless the land and cleanse the land and restore his true worship in his own people. 
There's a time to cast away stones. There's a time to throw them down and break them apart and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. We cannot embrace idolatry. We cannot embrace paganism. We cannot embrace the ways of the heathen, the worship of the heathen. We cannot countenance or ever approve of it. You know, most Protestants today, most pastors and pastorettes teach that let everyone worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience and let's not meddle with someone that's in error. Let's just pray for them and hope that they'll get a better frame of mind. Not like confront them and tell them what's wrong. In the New Testament, the idols of the pagans were left to stand in the town of Corinth and in other places. But the Christians who had been pagans, when they were born again and washed in the blood, they stopped attending pagan worship. They stopped approving of pagan worship. And they no longer ate meats that were offered onto idols. When men came to them and said, this, this bull was offered onto an idol. Come partake of it, the food thereof with me in the temple. They were not to do that because of the conscience of the other. They were not to offend the weak consciences of the idolaters, but they were to be bold and have a witness and a testimony that idolatry was sinful and wrong in all that it encompassed and all that it had to do with. That should be what agreement have the temple of God with idols? None. In popery, when it was accepted and received into the bosom of this nation, brought with it the seeds of the destruction of our republic and our worship of God in spirit and truth. It brought in with it the seeds of the destruction of the Presbyterians, of the Baptist, and of every other ilk, every other sect of the Christian religion. Brought about the seeds of the destruction of our republic and brought about the demise of Christianity in America. And there's so few that actually believe in Jesus Christ. Why, I'm preaching on the radio right now, and many of my listeners listen to Christian radio. You don't know what it means to be born again. You don't know what it means to be regenerated. You don't know what it means to be saved by the blood of the Lamb. I urge you to repent and believe the gospel. Urge you to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, that he's risen again, and he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, and that by his blood he can expiate, that is, put away all of your sins, past, present, and future, that he can make you a new creature, that he can give you hope, not just in this life, but in the life to come. That's the message of the gospel. It doesn't take long to preach it, does it? Boil it down to just like that, very, very simply. But... Last thing we're going to read now about Tittleman and what he did. Tittleman was an inquisitor. He marched around throughout the Netherlands by himself or with one or other two helpers with no fears at all of being accosted and being killed. Meanwhile, the sheriffs, just to go serve warrants, had to take at least a dozen or two dozen armed men with them. But he could go around and he was so feared, even the Duchess of Parma, who was the queen, as it were, of the Netherlands, the sister of the emperor was afraid of the inquisitor because he had power to kill anybody and everybody who disagreed with the Roman Catholic faith. And even good Catholics were terrified of him lest they slip up with their tongue and say something they ought not. They could be instantly hailed into prison, racked and tortured, and then killed by being burned at the stake or maybe just hung by a chain over a fire and slowly roasted. 